Welcome to a Date with Darkness podcast, where I will be discussing the impact of hurtful and abusive relationships and how to overcome them so that you can move through your pain and get to the kind of healthy relationships you want, need, and deserve. I'm Dr. Natalie Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist based in California. While I hope that you find this podcast educational and informational, please note it should not be substituted for treatment with a licensed mental health professional. Also, due to the nature of the podcast, some of the information presented on the show can be sensitive to some of my listeners. So please note that listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome back to the show. Super excited to be chatting with you. I really hope that you guys enjoyed the Boys to Men series um, that I've done for the past three shows. Uh, But I wanted to kind of shift gears on this particular episode and talk a little bit about um, challenges within the healing process. Um, so, you know, especially when you're, when you're, um, healing from narcissistic abusers, a number of challenges that people go through and healing is never easy. True healing, um, it's not, it's not an easy thing. It's not an overnight thing. It's not a, let me, um, you know, sort of take in all the information I can from Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and all these other platforms. And, you know, then I'm healed, you know, and that's usually what a lot of people typically tend to do when they um, are recovering from abuse or narcissistic abuse in particular, is they try to, you know, um, gorge on all this information, right? Just take in as much information as possible and get clarity and get understanding and why is this person this way? And what can I do to maybe help this person or help this situation? Am I doomed? Is it, is it what it is? Right. Um, you know, and so just to kind of go over some of those challenges, I definitely want to, um, you know, talk about them a little bit more in detail. I'm not, I'm not going to go over every single challenge, but I will go over some of the more, um, the ones that I get asked about or the ones that get talked about the most and that, um, you know, that something to be expected uh, during your healing journey, because healing is not for the week. Um, And so the first thing that I want to go over in terms of challenges within the healing process is healing should be focused on self. Um, The only person, meaning the only person that you can heal is yourself. Um, There are so many people that um, when they're working on their healing journey, they just want to fix their partner or fix their parent or fix the person that's um, inflicting pain or harm. And oftentimes that person is very resistant or they're not in alignment with wanting to work on healing or they're sort of, uh, they are blaming you as being part of the problem. And, you know, if you are a person that has been um, oppressed or abused for a long time, the biggest challenge that you have is trying to be perfect, trying to mold yourself to a likable, lovable person and really, um, really wanting to fix the situation or the person and get back um, to some sense of normalcy, some sense of happiness, some sense of where we love each other, right? And so you automatically, you you want to reach out, you want to help the person, you want to get back in alignment with the person that you care about. However, um, it's important to say that you can only work on yourself. Um, and, you know, no matter what that person is saying, yes, go ahead and set up the counseling session. Yes, you go ahead and find the therapist. Yes, you do all this, that, and the other thing. If they're not putting in the work, um, the relationship is already at an imbalance. Um, and there's a one-sided effort in terms of, um, you know, fixing the problem. If they're not approaching the situation with the willingness to, you know, get in there, get in the trenches and get their elbows dirty in terms of, you know, laying out all of their imperfections, their flaws and things that they need to work on, on the table, you're already 
in this game of uh, healing by yourself. And so um, that's important to know uh, two things there that one, you can only be responsible for your own healing and focusing on yourself um, is going to be uh, probably the best outcome, um, especially if they are uh, the best path to take. Um, even if you decide to go to couples therapy, you should, um, you should still be working in therapy on your own. So even if you decide to say, Hey, you know, I want to work it out with this person that's toxic or, you know, our relationship isn't good. Like, even if you do couples therapy, you should still be in therapy by yourself in addition to doing couples or family therapy family therapy, um, because the dynamics are going to be different. Um, when you're in therapy, it's going to be, you know, in, in when you're working on in therapy by yourself, the person that's, um, the therapist that's working with you in couples therapy may not be able to see the same things and the themes are going to be different. It can be super helpful and boost any work that you do decide to do together. If that's the route you decide to take, um, it's going to be that much more helpful. And a lot of times, um, you know, when clients come to me or when people come to me, they're like, oh, you know, I tried couples therapy and, you know, the couples therapist was being manipulated by my partner and my partner was just manipulative and the, the therapist ate it up and they couldn't see that. And so that's also another, um, reason why I recommend doing your own individual work is because again, um, themes and situations and dynamics are going to arise, um, but everyone has to do their work. And if you have a partner that's manipulative, if you have a partner that's abusive, it's, it's especially important to be seeing someone who could say to you, um, especially in a safe environment, which is one-on-one, -on -one, um, that, hey, you're being abused, this is what's happening, and, and, and someone who is definitely objective and can help you through that, but also so that you can stay focused on your own journey and explore uh, what your um, needs are, what, um, if, you know, if there needs to be any sort of crisis management, any sort of safety management, um, those are things that you need to focus on and, you know, just raising your own sense of awareness. Um, and that comes out of pursuing your own healing journey. The second challenge that may arise during healing process is, um, and I think that I've talked about this before and relative to another episode is that, um, you know, there, there may be people in your life that don't believe that you're going through abuse. Um, uh, the abuser may uh, receive more support. Um, and so I think just having, having people around you to nurture and support you and validate your experiences can be challenging, especially if people know you as the couple or people know you as so-and-so's daughter, right? And if that person's toxic, but they, but you know, no one ever sees that except behind closed doors, but they have this great image with everybody else and everybody else knows this person to be extremely giving, extremely charm, charming, the life of the party, uh, extremely charitable, right? And they've, they've done a good job of sort of putting on airs or living a double identity, uh, but you're the only person or, you know, maybe the family is only, are the only people that get to see the abusive side. Um, there are, there are, there are going to be people that may not necessarily believe you. Um, there in that um, belief in and of itself doesn't necessarily have to be um, a challenge. If you're an adult, um, if you are a child, that becomes extremely invalidating and extremely harmful. But even as an adult, um, it can become more challenging as an adult when a person doesn't believe you, but they sort of you know, they are, um, they are doing the dirty work of the narcissistic person. They're reporting back things, or they're even reporting things back to you that the, the narcissistic person is, um, this doing and sort of, um, maybe even just the boundaries aren't good or the lines are blurred and they may be putting you in more danger. They may be um, giving up sensitive information that you don't want to be relayed. They may be causing you emotional uh, distress by telling you what the other person is doing and how happy they are and 
they're seeing somebody else and all this other kind of stuff. So you just have to be mindful of um, the company that you keep. And if it's someone that you can trust, you don't want to, um, you don't want to be telling other people your next move and, um, you know, things, information that you want to keep to yourself, you know, or if situations escalate or become potentially dangerous and this person, um, you know, just sort of meddling in without good boundaries can be causing more harm uh, than good. You know, and, and this is very similar. Number three, um, you know, there are oftentimes when you Abuse, I've always said that abuse is never a linear thing, meaning that it's very seldom, I don't I don't know that I've ever had someone that I've worked with where they're just getting abused in one relationship, even though you may be experiencing um, particular type of abuse, such as physical or sexual, right, with an intimate partner, um, more often than not, abuse themes are arising in other relationships too. And um and typically what tends to happen is you don't have a level of self-awareness of, you know, where other toxic behaviors or unhealthy behaviors are taking place until you work on the relationship that's causing you the most duress at the moment. So for example, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of times when, uh, you know, people may be uh, having challenges with their intimate partner, right? Um, and there's some abuse going on within their intimate partnership. If you if you sort of trace it back, a lot of times they've had um, or may maybe even still continue to have abusive uh, dynamics with their parents or family of origin, right? And so even if, it, if that abuse is psychological or is financial or what have you, um, a lot of times you'll trace abusive themes to other areas of life. And that can also include your job and other, other, um, other places in your life where you may be experiencing some unhealthy abusive dynamics as well. And so what you may find is that, um, you know, again, other people around you are toxic, but that you, it becomes a challenge when you feel like, oh my gosh, everyone around me, when, when you have this level of self-awareness, everyone around me is extremely toxic or abusive and unhealthy. And how did I not see this before? And my goodness, I must have just been a, you know, a poor judge of character. I, I didn't judge people well. And so now I have all these toxic people in my life that I feel like I have to clear out or, you know, do something with the relationship dynamics and, uh, you know, with all these people and all this, um, these themes of abuse sort of rising up around me, I have to basically get rid of everyone, right? And so you may find that, again, that you are out of alignment with a lot of people that you have in your life. Um, other people may um, have challenging personalities and might not see you doing well. Or, you know, a lot of times, too, when people see you healing, they begin to act differently sometimes and so what you may what you may start to notice as you're healing is that you know again these these relationships where you've always sort of been like they've been your confidant and they've you know they've kind of given you advice you may start to notice that oh you know now that I'm changing and I'm improving the quality of my life you may start to notice some themes such as jealousy envy or insecurity um, with other people where um, you know they may start to attack your character or they may say that um, you're too good for me or you or you think you're too good for me or you think you're better than me right and they they want to they call themselves trying to humble you or bring you back down right because they don't like the new and improved version or the healing version of you right or that they consider that to be a threat to them and so they basically um you know they start to become um uh they start to attack you a lot more um you know and one example i can give and this is one that um you know, that I've, I've noticed over the years, not so much now, but I remember like, you know, when I was first going through my healing journey and, um, you know, I feel like I could share this with you guys, but I, I remember like when I was first going through, um, 
you know, my journey and just sort of working on myself and, you know, you know, my journey, I was going to therapy every week and all, you know, just really just purging and just laying, laying my stuff out on the table and really getting in there doing the work, doing the self-help books, doing the journaling and, um, you know, just really starting to uh, evaluate relationships and people, myself, um, you know, just where I was at in life, goals, values, those kinds of things. And one of the things that I started to notice, and I, I know that I have a lot of healers um, that listen to this podcast. So healers, you guys will probably resonate with this is like, you know, when you, when you, when you're intentional about how you move and how you want your life to look and um, just sort of uh, the words you speak and just what you want for yourself, you start to speak different. You start to move different. Your energy is different. And if you have toxic people in your life, they don't like that. Um, they don't, they don't like that. And the first thing that, it, you know, and, and you may start to, um, have a little bit more conflict with the toxic people in your life because now they're starting you're you're noticing that they're disrespecting you they're disrespecting your space and um and they don't like that they're noticing this change in you and they don't like it right and which doesn't matter anyway it doesn't matter if they don't like it but they do have to respect it um they have to respect whatever boundaries you put into place whether they like it or not but um, one of the things that I noticed that people would do is they would, um, they attack, um, they attack your, your job. And, and it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's like saying, don't speak to me in that, um, you know, that therapist talk, or you think you're too, don't, don't try to therapize me or, you know, something like that. And it's just like, what, where's that coming from? And what, one of the things that I have noticed is that people usually do that one when they feel like, okay, they want to try to, you know, write the ship and make the dynamics what it was, um, or you're calling them on something that they don't like or two or three, um, they are emotionally unavailable and people that are emotionally unavailable, um, which is another Another thing is like you start to speak with feeling words more. It's like I feel or, you know, I, I this is how this makes me feel or, you know, that's not OK because that makes me feel, you know, people that are emotionally unavailable, um, you know, and they're they're extremely toxic and abusive. They don't like it when you use feeling words. Right. And so when you when you're kind of um, when someone isn't able to express how they how they feel, they may look down on you for expressing how you feel. And so they definitely want to um they want to try to regain the power in the relationship. And part of the way that they regain the power in the relationship is sort of putting down, you know, like, you know, things that are very important to you, you know, that, that those things are things that they may feel threatened by. And it's like, oh, you're don't, don't talk to me like I'm a patient and don't, don't, don't be a doctor to me. I don't need no damn doctor or something like that. They would say, you know, it's just like, oh, that's interesting because I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't speak like a therapist, but I do speak differently, um, now that I'm healed. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and I've worked with clients all over and just kind of, I keep it real with whoever like is in my circle. So I feel like I speak to everyone in the same way. And even on this podcast, and this isn't meant to be defensive, but this can just sort of paint a portrait. But even on this podcast, I've been very careful to um, break things down or try to break things down in a more simplistic way or a more relatable or layperson way so that it's not filled with a lot of jargon. Um, and if you notice, if you've done a lot of research and work on narcissistic abuse, a lot of the stuff um, can use a lot of jargon and people oftentimes have to research it, like hoovering and trauma bonding and things like that. And where I've talked about those things, but I'm very careful to use a different type of language on this show and on this platform in a much more relatable way in words that we use every single day. Hoovering is not a word that you use every day. Triangulation 
aren't words that you use every day. Um, you know, and if you do, that might come from just the information that you're absorbing and just where you're at. But those are words that I don't uh, include um, on this show. And I may do a breakdown of definitions later. But um, all that just to say is that everyone I talk to is in a relatable way. But people can definitely... Um, People can definitely try to go for the jugular on the things that are closest to you or they feel like you're more passionate about to try to bring you down um, when they see that you're healing. Um, so that's, you know, I, I know I went on a bit of a tangent there, but that's what I kind of wanted to wrap that up and say. Healing is a, is a lonely process. Uh, healing is not a group effort, typically. Um, even if you if you're in a family of you know, 10 and all of you kind of go through, you know, lived in the same house and you dealt with the same similar types of abuse. Um, it's still, you have to go on your own journey. And I know I kind of spoke about that before, but there are people that feel like, Hey, I want to kind of, you know, I want to do this with somebody else, or I want us to heal together, but you have your own journey. Even if you're in the same relationship, you have different elements, different core wounds, um, you know, different dynamics. Um, you perceive the world and people in a different way. So basically a different reality. Um, so it's a lonely process. Um, and the things that you're going to be healing from doesn't necessarily mean that the other person, other people are, are going to be healing from that, or that you guys are going to be on the same, um, timeline, um, because healing, everyone sort of goes through this, uh, different sort of journey. And if you've taken anything else, um, any sort of, um, interpersonal workshop or any personal interpersonal coaching or things like that, whether it be for dating, whether it be for weight loss, whether it be for whatever the finances or something like that, everyone in that coaching, like if it's like a group coaching or whatever, everyone is kind of like at a different stage of healing, um, regardless of you guys all going through the same lessons or what have you. Um, everyone's at a different stage. And some people stay on a stage for months, weeks, and years. And that's just the reality, you know, because you don't, you don't necessarily know what they went through and, and they may not even necessarily remember or recall what they went through until they get in there and start doing the work. And then it might cause them to feel triggered. It might cause spiraling. It might cause them to be um, acutely aware. It might cause some symptoms such as depression or anxiety. Um, and it might cause them to want to retreat and not work through this right now. Um, or you may feel like, okay, I'm ready to do this work. I have this level of awareness and I'm ready to do it. You know, so everyone's going to be in a different space and it's a healing healing journey is a lonely process. And sometimes a lot of times you may have to retreat and do this work alone because you are going through your own, um, energetic shift. You're doing your own work. And so, um, you know, part of that may mean that you need, may need to spend time alone. You may need to process your feelings by yourself. You may need to journal, write things down. You may need to take a walk out in nature, or you just may not need to deal with people right now because the world is intense. And so, um, again, healing is a lonely place. Even if you are, um, you know, if you're with a group of people or what have you, and I do therapeutic groups all the time, um, which I love, but your own work is your journey. And that is um, only a, a path that you can take by yourself. Even if you have support from other people, um, everything that you're going through, unfortunately, you won't be able to share, right? Or even if you are able to share, other people won't necessarily be able to relate, support, or just get it. And that's okay. Um, so it can be very lonely, especially when you get to the, to the deep work, uh, very deep. And it's like, you know, you start really having these epiphanies and this different level of awareness, and you really start to level up. Um, as you start to level up, especially, right. And if you start to really transform, 
chances are you may have to clear a lot of people out of your life and you're going to feel very alone. And that might take some time before you, um, before you are able to connect with people that get it or who have um, very similar values or similar interests and things like that, because it's very possible that if once you do the work, you just change. Growth brings about change and you're just not the person that you were. That might've been three months ago. That might be six months ago. That might've been five, 10 years ago. Uh, but whenever that, that process of transformation happens, you're different. And so, you know, conversations may feel like you may feel like, uh, you know, this conversation, like, I don't, these aren't conversations that I really have or that I really care to have anymore. These aren't things that I really care to do anymore. Uh, I might not, you know, I might not have the same lifestyle. My lifestyle may be healthier. You know, I, you know, and so I, I, I may choose to not engage in gossip or, you know, be around people who engage in gossip or talking negatively uh, because that's just not where I'm at in life anymore. And so, you may start to definitely clear out your circle and feel like, okay, I, I can only spend so much time or maybe I can't spend any time uh, with those people anymore that I used to be connected with when I was going through so much stuff. When you're in an abusive um, relationship, your priority is focusing on your abuser and making your abuser happy or making it so that things aren't chaotic at home, things are safe at home. And so again, starting, you know, again, with just sort of people pleasing, walking on eggshells, making yourself invisible, right? Or you, when you're oppressed, you don't really have an identity. You don't really have a voice. Um, you, you're not really expected to have feelings, expect, except to feel like, you know, what can I do to make sure things go smoothly with my abuser? And so when you start your healing journey and when you get well on your healing journey and you start to detach uh, from the abusive person or the abusive environment, um, managing your emotions, like emotions are going to be new and you're going to have different feelings. And, um, you know, when I'm working with my clients, one of the things that I love to do, because a lot of times they can't tell me how they feel uh, because they're so used to feeling emotionally numb, or they may be used to intellectualizing their feelings. And instead of describing a feeling, right, they are more apt to describe an action, right, or a, a, another person's actions, right, because um they're not in touch with your feelings. And so I always like to help them get more in touch with their feelings through a variety of exercises and looking at things um, such as a feelings wheel where you can Google that on Google and you can see all of the different types of feelings. You know, just a, just a quick picture of different types of feelings that people can and should have, right? Because feelings are a spectrum, right? Um, and so just learning how to manage your emotions, especially as you become more aware, as you, you know, again, as you start to detach from the abusive situation, as you start to learn to feel safe in your own body and in your own mind, um, and just around other people, you know, memories and things like that may bubble back up to the surface and, you know, just sort of managing memories and how you feel about certain um, memories that you may have, um, you know, because I know for myself, I have memories. Um, and sometimes, you know, a lot of times there'll be certain memories that I have every single day, you know, because I'm a, I'm a, um, what do you call that? I, I like to consider myself a sensitive person and not to make it about me. But if you're sensitive, like I am, there are certain things that you just can't let go or that may hurt you for a very long time or that may stick with you for a long time or that you feel like, you know, damn, why can't I just get over it? Right. And like, why does this keep coming? Why does this stay with me? Right. And so, again, it may just be that you have to do some feelings work. Right. Learn to self-regulate and process how you feel about um, the situation what was done to you about even the person that did it to you too, right? Because there may be painful situations that um, 
someone caused you, someone in your life caused you to endure. But if your focus is, oh gosh, I got to, you know, maintain the relationship with that person. A lot of times people will check out of their feelings in order to stay in a relationship with a toxic person um, just to make it work because they are so hell bent on staying in a relationship or that's, you know, those, those narratives, like that's my mother, that's my father, that's my sister. That's, uh, you know, I love this person. I've got to, I've got to work it out. So I've got to put my feelings up on a shelf and just be in this situation and work it out the best way that I can. And that's survival mode. Um, so if you're running in survival mode, a lot of times you'll, you'll compartmentalize or you'll, you'll internalize your feelings and put them on the shelf. And, and in turn, you'll make yourself the bad guy. And, you know, before you say that this person did something bad to you or they hurt you, you'll internalize and make it seem like you're the bad guy. Um, just so that you can make it work in that relationships. And that means, you know, getting rid of your feelings or your emotions about what's happening and, and about that person. But uh, once you do start to manage, you know, once you do start to experience emotions, um, that can be very challenging because you're like, oh my God, what is this? And I, I don't know, I feel guilty for having feelings, right? I feel guilty or I feel like I'm betraying um, someone by having feelings about them that aren't positive or having feelings about what they did to to me. And so a lot of times it can be, a, a, a you could feel like you're betraying someone or betraying, or um, you, you could just feel guilty because again, we've been taught not to, you know, if, if you've, if you're a good person um, by nature, or you've grown, grown up in an abusive dynamic, um, a lot of times you've been groomed to be the bigger person, right? And a lot of times, um, and I think uh, when I had my my interview with Dr. Sherry, Sherry and I spoke on this, um, Dr. Sherry Campbell, a lot of times, um, especially when you grow up in abusive families, if you're the child in that, in that situation and you want to separate yourself from that, nobody wants to provide sympathy um, to the child. You know, there's, there's this you know, there's this communal force or push to, you know, you be the bigger person or those are your parents and, you know, la, la, la. you know, you know how those messages go. And so um, they're not really validating you. They're, they're basically telling you whatever it was, it's not that bad. You need to put your feelings up on a shelf and you just need to suck it up because those are the only people in your life that you're going to get. And so it can be really challenging to manage your emotions and those messages that you get. So be sure to work with someone um, who is very gifted in helping you learn how to, to do all of those things, right? And to um, help you put everything in check and, you know, help you with feeling safe and laying out your feelings, laying out your emotions on the table. And yes, um, even if those emotions are anger, because I think that's another emotion, a very powerful emotion that victims of abuse um, don't allow themselves to have, right? Because you were always taught that you you don't have the right to be angry about anything or you know if you cry i'll give you something to cry about and some of those those um those hurtful messages there and so um just be mindful about you know laying your feelings out and um sometimes that may require you to emotionally check in with yourself throughout the day like how am i feeling what's triggering that right and that's called called mindfulness, right? Um, so mindfulness, um, I definitely engage in a lot of that with my clients. Okay. So I hope, um, that, you know, this has been extremely helpful to you. And if it has been, if you feel like, you know, Hey, some of these challenges definitely resonate with me and I've had them definitely leave a comment. If you're watching this down on YouTube, um, and, um, if you like this podcast, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And, um, you know, until next time you guys take care of yourselves, be well, and keep on healing. Bye now. Check out the sneak preview of next week's episode. Unfortunately, what you've learned is that conflict can be very destructive, but in all actuality, conflict is very healthy for us to have in our relationships. And 
Um, if it's done in a healthy way, conflict can be actually be very constructive where it can help us learn more about our partners and it can help us learn how to adjust more healthily in our relationships with people because uh, conflict is actually something that happens with everybody. But if you avoid having conflict at all costs, that means that your relationship cannot deepen. It means that it's surface level relationships, right? And that you don't get a chance to foster growth um, and connection on a much deeper level with your partner.